Almighty God, it is a joy to come into your presence. We know that you are here, O God, for you have said, where two or more are gathered, there you shall be also. O God, the pollen tells us that uh, spring is coming, the flowers are blooming, the azaleas are waking up and, and proclaiming your glory. All around us, O God, the world is coming back to life. And we find ourselves in this season of life, this season in which we prepare for the death, but also the resurrection of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. O God, we come into your presence, prepared and with anticipation of what you will do in our lives, in this service, and as we go forth from this place. Open our eyes that we may see, our ears that we may hear, in our hearts, that we may truly know and understand all you have to say to us in this place, on this beautiful morning. For we offer ourselves in worship, in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith with the historic confession, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seat. If you have children with you this morning, I hope you'll let them come spend a few minutes with me. Well, good morning, everybody. Here come my balcony crew sliding in for a stop. What's happening, everybody? Well, I'm feeling a little better this Sunday than I was last Sunday. Y'all remember that I had... had been out to the West Coast and lost some sleep, and then we all lost an hour's sleep, and so I was just dragging, and, and it's taken me all week, I think, to catch up, but you know what I figured out, and I love this time of year, is that I, then I get, I feel like I get so much more done once I get adjusted, because it stays light longer in the day. Now, how many of you need some light to wake up? Do any of you need light in the morning to wake up? I kind of I do. I, I need a little bit of light to wake up. And light helps me get energized. Let me ask it this way. If it's really bright in your room, can you get to sleep? Is it hard to get to sleep if there's a lot of light on? No, maybe not. Some of, you, you can, some of us can sleep anytime. Well, light, we're, you know, we've talked about this before in the last year, that Jesus said that he is the light of the world. So we talk about that, and what does that mean? And of course, one of the things is, is that, it just, that light is a good thing, and it brightens everything up. But one of the other things that light is, is light is energy. The reason that things start blooming is that the sun gets closer to the earth, and it warms things up, and as the ground warms up, then plants begin to bloom. There's that, that sheen of yellow on our cars right now, and all that pollen from all this stuff that's blooming. But all that is because the light creates energy. And energy is a good thing. You guys have a lot of energy. I know that you have a lot of energy because I know when I hear you playing down in Sunday school and running around the church, I know you have a lot of energy. And that energy comes from the light, and that energy comes from God in Christ. And so I like having it light longer in the day because I can get more done because I feel more energized and I feel more ready to do all those things I need to do. But I'm excited to see you all this morning. I want you all to find that insert in your bulletin and get your parents to sign you up for the Easter egg hunt. We're going to have a ton of fun that Saturday, and it'll be a great time. Will you all bow your heads and pray with me? Y'all repeat after me. 
Dear God, thank you for the light. Help us to use our energy to make a difference in the world for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you on ahead and sit with your parents and go out to Children's Church. seated. As we had our bulletin inserts out, I failed to remind you to, uh, to please register your attendance. It's on the reverse side of the sign up for the Easter egg hunt. You can also find attendance registration cards there in the pew back in front of you. I invite you to fill those out over the next few minutes and place it in the offering plate when it comes by. If you're visiting with us for the first time, please, please fill that out so that we might know who are, you are and how we might be able to serve you. Um, also want to have you look at our prayer list that's on the reverse of your bulletin and all of those names that are listed there that are friends and family of the congregation. Um, uh, Wally and Carol are back from taking care of, of business related to Wally's uncle's death um, this past week, and we certainly we announced that last week. We're glad to have you all home, and there will be a uh, graveside service tomorrow at Eleventon at Arlington Memorial Park in Sandy Springs, um, and so encourage anyone that can be there to do so. We certainly continue to express our condolences uh, to your family. Um, Monday, we had a beautiful service uh, down in East Point for our dear friend Clarence, and it was a wonderful celebration um, of life, and, uh, and it was just a, a good time. We had a number of folks from Atlanta First. I'm so proud of the Atlanta First family for being there, uh, for Clarence's family, 
and it was a, it was a wonderful, wonderful service. A couple of celebrations. Uh, one I meant to mention last week. I think I've mentioned it once, but I just want to make sure that I, that I'm clear about this. Is that um, y'all know that uh, this past August 23rd we celebrated the one year anniversary of our day school. And two weeks ago, we registered the 100th student in our day school. As of this week, we have 102 students enrolled in the Atlanta First Day School. Um, I was hoping Linda would be here this morning, but that is a tremendous celebration. Um, that we have 102 families, or roughly there's a few siblings in there, but roughly 100 families that are a part of our Atlanta First family uh, that weren't we didn't even know about um, about a year and a half ago. And so that is a tremendous celebration. And I'm just grateful to all the vision that went into that, the hard work that went into that, and certainly this past year and a half. Uh, Linda and Jeannie and their dedicated staff and all that they do to make that uh, such a wonderful program um, and such a wonderful ministry for this church. Another thing is some of y'all had some Sunday school classes upstairs and knew that there were some folks in the building, but not everybody new. Um, you, you may not be aware, but because of, of this church this past week, um, uh, we were able to serve at Project Open Hand. Now, not a person from Atlanta First served at Project Open Hand, but 10 students and a faculty advisor from Appalachian State University stayed with us this week. And we're, we're unable to accommodate large groups right now because the, the showers that we installed during the Olympics are not in good repair, but we have one shower in the building that they can use. And so they did an alternate spring break, and they spent the week here and um, saved them money and were, allowed them to serve. And they left me a wonderful thank you note this morning on my desk, and they, uh, they left me with, a, with an Appalachian State um, uh, uh, banner there. Um, and so we're going to hang that up somewhere in the building to uh, remind us of that. But increasingly, this is being a place where people want to come and, and serve and I feel that's part of what Atlanta First is being called to do is not just the service we do, but find ways to open our doors to others that want to come and serve through here. Uh, as I said already this weekend, you know, tens of thousands of people were around our church yesterday for the St. Patrick's Day Parade, and, and several thousand people are, are around the city this morning running in the half marathon and the marathon. We, we're at the center. We're in the heart of this city with so much going on. And increasingly, we're going to be called upon to, to, to be light that we'll talk about here in a few minutes. And so I am so excited about all the things going on in the life of our church. We join with me now as we go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we do give you thanks for this place we call Atlanta First United Methodist Church. We thank you for the opportunity to come and worship and lift up our voices in prayer. Thank you for the men and women throughout the years who have served this city and beyond as members of this church. I thank you that the doors of this church are open to any and all who will come our way. I thank you that more and more are coming our way, oh God. And I pray that we continue to make sure that there is a place for everyone and that each person comes into this place and feels your love your hospitality, and begins to hear your call to be in ministry in this place. God, we lift up to those this morning, we lift up to you this morning, those who are grieving, and for those who have lost loved ones, we know that you bring healing and hope in times of despair. God, we lift up to you our nation as Many continue to struggle in so many ways. May this church continue to find ways to reach out and to make a difference in the lives of others. God, we thank you for those who serve us as we continue to hear desperate stories from war-torn areas. May we all give thanks for those who serve faithfully in our military that protect us here and do their best to bring freedom to every corner of the world. Continue to keep them safe, O oh God. And when they come home, may they find a country that respects them and appreciates them and takes care of them. God, we thank you for the church, not just here in Atlanta or not just in the United States, but the church throughout the world 
that seeks to be your hands and feet to make a difference in the lives of others. God, we also come to this time of offering. We come to this time where we acknowledge that all that we have and all that we are is a gift from you. And each Sunday morning we make a decision on how much of that we're going to return back to you through your tithes and our offerings, O oh God. We, we come bringing what we have, offering it to you and praying that you will bless these gifts, that you'll multiply them and that you will give us the gift of discernment and wisdom to be good stewards of all that's entrusted to us, that we might continue to reach out, that might, people might find a way out and find a way up. God, accept these, our prayers, and these, our gifts. For we offer them in the name of Christ, our Lord, who taught us that when we gather, we should pray with one voice. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
Out of respect for the reading and hearing of God's word, I invite you to stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel lesson. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and his life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. And the, world became, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory as the glory of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this was a, a, an interesting week for, for a number of reasons. Um, I mentioned that, that on Monday we celebrated the life of Clarence Williams and we had a wonderful service uh, down in East Point at the funeral home with his family and friends, and, and it was just a very fitting tribute to him. On Friday, I was at the funeral of, uh, of a uh, dear friend's sister who died young and unexpectedly. We've been alongside uh, Carol and Wally as they have dealt with the unexpected death of, of Wally's uncle. Um, and then I, I had several friends that mentioned to me that they felt as though they had been around more death this year than they had in, in a while, that in, so early in the year. And these things just happen, and, and there's no rhyme or reason to them, but uh, certainly it's something that, that I've been aware of. It's also unique for me these days to have been to two funerals in one week and not to be officiating either one of them, um, and, and to go and to just be able to, along with family and friends, celebrate that person's life. It's it's a different discipline uh, attending uh, whatever it may be, whether it's leading worship or officiating a wedding. I also went to a wedding last week. I, I've been to a couple weddings this year where I was just in attendance. And, and um, those of you that know me well know that I don't sit still well. Um, and so to go to something that I'm usually uh, in charge of or, or helping to lead or facilitate uh, makes for a very nervous person. But when I allow myself to kind of be fully present in that moment. It's a wonderful reminder of why I do what I do. When I see others do it so well and with such grace and with such dignity, it helps remind me of who I am and, and the ministry to which I've been called. It was also a crazy week because people that love numbers love this week. It, it started off on, on um, March 14th, and people were posting on Facebook and saying that it was Pi Day. Um, and not the kind of pie you can eat, although because it was pie day, a lot of people made pies. Um, most of us somewhere along the way learned that uh, pie was a number that you used to calculate the, the circumference of a circle based on its diameter, and, and uh, pie is 3.14 and a bunch of other numbers, and we've never found the repeating decimal, and so it just goes on forever and ever and ever. So people got excited about pie day, and then and then uh, the next day was the Ides of March. It was March 15th, and so the day on which Julius Caesar was killed, and in the Roman calendar, the middle of the month, uh, the word being in its Latin roots, meaning middle, and so the Ides of March being the 15th of March. And then the next day was March 16th, and so Christians were claiming that to be John 3.16 day, and, and so uh, we were all, um, all, all writing about John 3.16, and you were hearing a lot about that and buzz about John 3.16. And then it was March 17th, and it was St. Patrick's Day, and you had to wear green or get pinched, and everything was green yesterday in Atlanta. The waterfalls were green. The streets were green. I've been told the beer was green. Um, just been told that, um, um, that, that, that everything was green. The most disturbing commercial I saw all week was a, a, an advertisement for Burger King and green ketchup. 
that just looked disgusting. Like, I don't, I, I don't know even if I closed my eyes and it tasted just like regular ketchup. I'm not sure I could eat green ketchup. You ask me what this has to do with the sermon, I'm not really sure that it has anything in the world to do with the sermon. Other than the fact that I've told you before about the lectionary, and I sometimes preach from lectionary, sometimes I don't. I'm kind of all over the place. We do series from time to time. But generally during Lent and Advent, I at least make sure that I've read through the lectionary text for the week and kind of get a feel for what's going on in the life of the Christian calendar. And this week, the lectionary text was actually from the third chapter of John, which includes John 3.16. Now, I read from John 1 because... John 1 is is just one of my favorite parts of the Bible. That That whole opening verse to John, the way that John announces Christ to the world, whereas Luke spends all this time in his birth and all the details surrounding that. John simply says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then he launches in to Jesus' ministry. But all of us know John 3.16. I've preached from it recently. But the entire... entire, um, section this morning goes from John 11 um, through uh, John 3, 11 through 3, 18. And, And it begins, very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And we all know this verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but... Those who do not believe are condemned already because they have believed, have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light because their eeds were evil. For all who hate evil hate the light, or all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true run toward the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds that have been done have been done in and through God. So there's a constant theme of light in John's gospel. Throughout the gospels as a whole, Jesus is constantly referred to as the light. And over the past several weeks, several months, I've been talking with Don and Ariel and, 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 our, and, our, and our entire team here at Atlanta First about worship and service and, and what we do as a church. And, and I've determined that among the central things to me in ministry is energy. I've told you before that there's a, there's a three-pronged stool on which I stand, and that, the three prongs of that stool are in integrity, excellence, and service. But if, if there's something that, that holds that stool up, if it's something that strengthens that stool beyond those three, those three um, posts, then it's energy. Energy is what drives us. Energy is what makes us who we are. Energy is literally the source of life. When we talk about Christ's light having come into the world, what we're really talking about is that the energy of God has come into being, the very essence of who we are. Now, most of y'all know that I studied just a couple blocks from here, and, um, and I was supposed to learn a lot about a lot of different things. Um, I, y'all know that I've confessed before that I didn't learn quite as much about as many things as I should have. I took physics and calculus. Um, I sat in class most of the time, some of the time, and listened. But, but I didn't always absorb everything. But there's one equation with which we're all pretty familiar. I think probably one of the most well-known equations in the world. In, in Einsteinian physics, what is E equal? E equals? 
MC squared. See, y'all, y'all are all tech physicists this morning. Y'all should be proud of yourselves. E equals MC squared. And, and, and the E in that is energy. And what Einstein figured out when he was studying energy is that even a body at rest possesses energy. That even when, we're, when a body is completely at rest, that body possesses energy. And then you've got mass, and then you've got the speed of light in a vacuum. So energy and light find themselves in one of the most revolutionizing, one of the equations that revolutionize the way we think about life and, and our purpose in it. So what about this, this thing of energy? Um, I, you know, Zach is growing up now, and, and we, we have to go back and think about the movies we watched when he was little. One of our favorite movies to watch when Zach, when he was little, was Monsters, Inc. See, when, when your children are little, you have to grab onto some movies that, that you can watch over and over again. And you have to steer them clear of movies that you just can't stomach one more time. I, I, you know, I, I, Barney was not going to happen in our house. I can just tell you, it was not going to happen. But, but Monsters, Inc. and Cars and a few others made the, the rounds. And it's kind of embarrassing because every once in a while now, I would, ju- I would love to, to uh, break them out and, and watch them. How many of you have seen Monsters, Inc.? Some, a few. Oh, wow, not that many people. Wow. So you need to go rent this movie and see it. And I can tell you, there's times before where I've been careful about recommending movies, but I know for sure there's no bad words or no inappropriate stuff in that one. So... Um, So here's the, I don't want to blow it for anybody that might go get it and watch it, but here's the bottom line, is that in a desperate need to to find energy, um, they, 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 they figure out that they can get energy from children's screams, and so they have these monsters that that pass through this dimension, and they go into the bedrooms of children, and when those children scream, they're they're actually able to capture their screams in a bottle and use that to power this, this monster-laden planet. But what they figure out over time is that laughter has far more energy and that, that, that you can run things on laughter thousands of times longer than you can run them on, on screaming. But it all has its essence in the energy of children. We, we all know, most of us, I mean, most children, not all, every, every child's different, but for most of us, as we experience children, and particularly in the ages of many of the ones we saw here this morning, children just have so much energy. A friend of mine that I had lunch with this week, he, his conversations alone bring me energy, but he's talking about his son. He said, you know, I don't think my son's going to ever be an athlete, but I have to have him involved in sports right now because he has to have an outlet for all that energy. He has to be able to do something with all that stuff that's bottled up inside of him. And so, and so it's soccer or baseball or football or something that allows kids to get out and run and play and, and to, to get that energy going and flowing. Energy is at the root of who we are in the church because people are drawn to energy. People are drawn to a place where it seems as though things are going on. Uh, Energy is something that is attractive. Now, we all probably read a little bit too in this past few weeks about the solar flares that were taking place, these massive electromagnetic storms that were taking place across the sun's surface, and they had the potential to disrupt business as we know it on the earth. So much of the way we communicate and live these days is, is, is dependent upon satellites that are in geosynchronous orbit above the earth. They, they, they stay in one place above one point on the earth, and that's what bounces signals from everything from cell phones to television signals all over the world. And the sun, as far away as it is, has these incredible bursts of power and energy that can disrupt everything that we're doing they can absolutely wreak havoc in the world. Now, the fact of the matter is that it wasn't near as, as bad as they thought it was. It kind of turned out to be kind of like Y2K, and it happened, and the northern lights were a little bit more beautiful and vibrant, but other than that, everything was okay. Energy 
is critical in our world. If you don't think energy is critical, there's a multi-billion dollar industry built around energy drinks. The gentleman who um, invented Red Bull died over the past couple days. It, he, was a, uh, he was an Asian um, chemist, and he came up with this, this formula, and he, he tried to sell it, and finally he kind of hooked up with this Australian entrepreneur who helped take what he had, and, and, and the name of his drink in his native language translated into English, Red Bull. Anybody ever heard of Red Bull? It's all over the place. And there's a whole market of energy drinks that are super packed with caffeine and other types of things that help to try to bring us energy, to energize us. Commercials for five-hour energy. We get to two o'clock in the afternoon and we hit the wall and we drop back to five-hour energy and it allows us to go the rest of the day. And of course, you know, you can't talk about energy without talking about what we're going through in the world is, is gas prices soar and as we look for alternate ways to power everything from cars to heaters to everything that we do. What's amazing is that for all the fossil fuels that we have, um, if we can get scientists to figure out a way to harness natural energy more efficiently, uh, solar and wind and all those various sources that are so amazing because I come back to the beginning which is that light is such a source of energy. I, I, I say fall is my favorite time of the year, and I, I stand by that, but I tell you, as I've walked in my backyard the past couple weeks, I'm amazed by spring. I'm amazed by these trees and these bushes and these plants that have sat dormant, many of them beneath the ground. But as the energy of the sun, sun warms the ground, as the days get longer and it's lighter, for more hours throughout the course of the day, the ends of these dormant trees and bushes begin to sprout buds, and those begin, buds begin to crack open over so slightly. And flowers and new leaves and new life come to the edge of all these things. It also brings with it bees and bugs and insects. Y'all, the, this, this mild winter may have been nice, um, but, but we're already seeing signs that a mild winter has not done much to control the insect population in Atlanta. But the spring brings with it life, and we see visible signs of that life. In general, I think people are drawn to bright colors and bright things, things that the light reflects off of and that we find absolutely beautiful. In, in this text from John's Gospel, both in the first chapter and in the third chapter, we're told about the light that Christ brings into the world, but what, what I believe Christ is bringing into the world is also energy. Now, how does that manifest itself in the church? One of those things is, is in worship. And, and, and worship is that place where we should come to both bring energy and receive energy and, and, and generate energy all at the same time. Now, I come every Sunday morning prepared to bring energy and to feed off the energy of those gathered here. I know that the choir and Don and Ariel come desiring to create an environment where you can feel energy. These incredibly talented people that bring energy song to us. Music has within it inherently a certain amount of energy. We sang one of my favorite hymns in the world this morning, and Don, now I fuss at Don sometimes for playing too loud. And he said, I, I don't guess you're going to fuss at me if I play joyful, joyful too loud, will you? And I, and I conceded that I wouldn't. Um, so those of you in the balcony, if it was loud, that was, I, I, I approved that this morning. That was an approved blowing out of the organ. That, that song, well, it's pure instrumental version, just to, to hear it in a symphony. And Ariel posted a, 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 a piece by a, an organist this week on YouTube um, playing a, a version of Ode to Joy, an arrangement of Ode to Joy. Here's the amazing thing about that. This organist lost his left arm in an automobile accident. 
And he played this incredible piece with one hand and two feet. And, and others that are in the organ community that commented on it said that that piece would have been difficult enough to play with two hands and two feet, much less one hand and two feet. I don't know if you ever watch what's going on on an organ console. And, and to have four limbs doing four different things, it's kind of like drummers. I'd never have figured out how you get four limbs to do four different things independently of one another. It's amazing. Tuesday night we went to the Fox to see the, the Billy Elliot and Mighty Moe was playing and, and, and watched that and then incredibly gifted dancers. The Billy Elliot's a story of a young boy that comes from a very desperate background to be able to become a, a, an incredible ballet dancer and the, 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 the energy of that music and dance was amazing. But in Lent, what we've got to remember is the source of all that energy for us begins and ends with God. And it begins and ends with Christ. That's the energy that we must possess. Jesus has got to be the source of all our energy. And let me tell you something. Just like solar flares can disrupt the world, Jesus' energy can disrupt the world. That's what Lent is all about, is that Jesus' energy reached such a point where he was disrupting the natural order of things. People who thought they had power realized that they were powerless in the presence of this man who called himself the Son of God. People who once thought they had all the answers suddenly had nothing but questions. People who once stood high and mighty suddenly found themselves in an inferior position. And Jesus did all of this through love and compassion and healing. Now when we get to Holy Week, we'll also see that Jesus also did this through frustration and accountability. For in our gospel lesson this morning, there's both grace and judgment. Now the judgment is filtered through grace, always. And it's not our judgment, it's God's judgment. For we don't judge, but God judges. Jesus also says it's not for him to judge, it's for him to love. The challenge that we have as a church, and particularly at Atlanta First United Methodist Church, is how do we generate energy? How do we leverage Christ's energy? Because all of us have energy. Einstein's, Einstein's uh, equation tells us that each of us possess energy even when we're sitting down not taking advantage of it. This church as a body, not this building, but the people who call themselves members, those are the church. We possess an energy that has been unleashed but is waiting to be fully unleashed so that we can become all that God is calling us to be. The other thing that they talk about is potential and momentum. There's potential energy, and then there's the energy that comes from momentum. The, the theory of the flywheel, that the more energy that is applied, the more energy that it produces. Critical mass, the tipping point. All these different ways that business authors over the past few years have tried to capture this. But what it means is that energy multiplies itself in amazing ways. That's what we're being called to do. And that's who we're called to be. Let's try to find that energy here and apply it, not for our sake, but for His. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Our hymn of invitation and commitment is hymn number 420, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Stand with me as we sing the first and the last verses.